Good evening and welcome to our fourth segment of Mental Health is a Serious Matter webinar series. Tonight we have a special guest and um, we are excited about the subject matter. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Nicole Jones and I come to you from Xi Zeta Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated out of Washington, DC. And we wanna thank you for joining us tonight. Hopefully some of you have been participating in this seminar with us since May. We started this as a awareness campaign during May, which is Mental Health Month. And we're glad that we are four months in and really bringing our community um, information that is valuable. And tonight we're gonna to be talking about mental health stigma. Um, but before we get started, I would like to welcome our, trying to get all of everything together, our chapter president, Courtney Coffey, to say a few words to get us started. Thank you so much, Nicole, and good evening, everyone, um, by way of Facebook, YouTube. Um, we definitely want you to uh, take the time to share uh, this great message uh, across the globe um, as we talk about mental health. Um, again, good evening. My name is Courtney Coffey. I have the honor and privilege of serving as president of the Xi Zeta Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and chairman of the Board of Directors for the Ivy Foundation, our program sponsor this evening. On behalf of the nearly 300 members of our chapter, I would like to thank you for joining us for part four of our monthly mental health series titled Mental Health is a Serious Matter. Tonight's program aligns with Alpha Kappa Alpha's Empower Our Families initiative, which aims to fortify families within our community by addressing childhood hunger and promoting positive youth development and leadership, mental health well being, and senior life. Our mental health spe series specifically seeks to fight stigma and raise awareness related to depression, anxiety, and trauma. Mental health affects us all. So it is so important to have the knowledge and tools to deal with this thing uh, that we call life, as Prince says. I'd like to thank our guest speaker who will be introduced shortly, our mental health subcommittee, our broader program committee, and of course you, our guest this evening for joining us. Thank you again, we're so appreciative. Um, I remind you all, um, feel free to share this recording uh, far and wide so that everyone can have the su support and tools to deal with mental health. Take care everyone, be well, and again, thank you. So I am up next to introduce our speaker for this evening. I am going to be reading um, a bio of his expertise. Um, so let me take off my glasses so I can see. And okay. Uh, Dr. Jeff Mincy is a native of Cincinnati, Ohio and a proud graduate of two of our finest HBCUs, receiving his bachelor's and master's degrees from Fisk University in psychology and clinical psychology, respectively. He finished up his academic training at Howard University, majoring in clinical psychology and, uh, with a minor in developmental psychology. Dr. Mincy is active globally and locally. He has worked with ministries of education in both the Caribbean and West Africa, providing educational development for teachers, administrators, families, students, and mental health staff. He is known for his dynamic speaking style, presentation style, bringing insight to thousands via his community workshops, courses, and lectures. As a scholar, Dr. Mincy, 
has presented a multitude of papers and workshops around the world, has authored 10 books, numerous articles, and several issues guides for the Kettering Foundation as a public scholar. He is currently an associate professor at Morgan State University Institute of Urban Research and, at, as, and is the immediate past president of the Association of Black Psychologists of the Washington DC chapter. He's also the creator of a hit radio show, Mind on the Matter. As an international consultant and coach, he has worked with the National Association of Independent Schools, annual People of Colors Conference, People of Color Conference, which drew over 7,000 attendees last year, the Walmart Corporation, the Ministry of Education of St. Kitts and Navy, Nevis, um, the Ministry of Education of the Gambia and the Trial Lawyers College, among others. We are so pleased to have him here today to talk with us about mental health stigma and um, really about the importance in, of changing the culture of stigma. And so the next voice you hear will be that of our speaker, Dr. Jeff Mincy. All right. Hey, good evening. And I want to say thank you uh, to the wonderful women of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, uh, specifically those of the Xi Zeta Mega Chapter. I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to speak. Um, and also a special shout out to a fellow Fiskite friend of mine, Dr. Ross, uh, you know, for extending the invitation directly. Uh, I always appreciate an opportunity uh, to speak on various platforms about mental health, you know, the various aspects of mental health. So again, I thank you all. Uh, when thinking about how to approach this topic tonight, there's so many different ways we could deal with stigma uh, and, you know, stigmas as it relates to mental illness, stigma as it relates to seeking professional help, you know, from mental health specialists. And so I figured that what I would do is on the first part of it is to talk about why that stigma exists. Right. Because a lot of times, you know, we talk about people's avoidance from uh, seeking help and avoidance of certain um, institutions or organizations or fields of, of help or assistance. And we don't necessarily dig deep down into why that exists. And so this thing called stigma is almost seems to be like a self-defeating behavior. Um, you know, why can't people just see the importance of it and go do it? But actually, when it comes to the mental health field, uh, the stigma is actually warranted. You know, the suspicion of seeking mental health services, you know, it, it's warranted. It's like deserved on many, many levels. And so what I decided to do tonight is to first talk about the context within which this stigma, this stigma exists. Right. So I want to talk about. Um, you know, the racism that exists in mental health uh, and in the field of mental health, both on the end of developing uh, psychological theories, uh, uh, approaches to mental uh, illness and mental health, as well as the diagnostic process and the overall organization of APA, the American Psychological Association. And we'll talk a little bit about the American Psychiatric Association as well. But I'm going to focus most of my talk as far as the context for stigma on the American Psychological Association, who recently uh, apologized apologize for, for psychology's role in racism, uh, both as an active participant in it, as well as, uh, as you know, just not stepping up in ways that the organization could have. Um, it has a long history uh, of, of psychological racism. Uh, and so what we'll do is we'll go straight to their documents and actually look at, you know, some of the examples. Um, and so what I, what I start off with is, I guess I bring up, and I'm always, I'm always against the clock. So, <laughs> you know, however long I get, no matter what I'm talking about, it's never enough time. So <laughs> forgive me if I go kind of fast. And, and matter of fact, um, you know, if some of the sisters that are still online, uh, if you all could just kind of, you know, if, if I'm going too fast, just kind of throw up a hand or something to let me know to kind of slow it down a bit. Or if it's, you know, hopefully get into some Q&A. And if you just need me to slow down or repeat something, just pop it in the chat for me. And I have no problem with doing that. But whenever I'm time conscious, I can tend to speed up a little bit and run through information kind of quickly. So if I need to slow down, just give me the cue and I'll do it with no problem. Um, so again, let's let's start with this apology that the APA issued. And again, it's a it's a very general apology. And I do approach the apology uh, kind of critically, although, you know, I do applaud the APA for issuing the apology. And I definitely applaud the work of everybody that came together to uh, to to pull this apology together and this proclamation together. Uh, it's complete with the historical timeline. So we're going to look at the apology itself. Uh, and I want to shout out to uh, Dr. Miriam Jernigan. As you'll see when we get to the apology, uh, her, the Jernigan and Associates 
actually contributed to some of the background work that the APA actually used. And uh, Miriam is actually a uh, soror. You know, she's a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. Uh, she came through in the fine pie chapter down at Fisk University. It's one of my classmates. And so I was very proud to see Miriam's name um, in, in the document. So, where the, you know, Jernigan and Associates, you know, it's a really big deal. She's been doing work on the front lines of uh, racism and psychology, racism, period, uh, you know, since undergrad and all through grad school. She's working with Dr. Janet Helms, which is a giant amongst giants. Dr. Helms is a brilliant, brilliant sister. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Helms started off as a mathematician. And, you know, she was, you know, deep off in the mathematics. And then she crossed over to the world of psychology. I can't remember the exact story anymore. But I was so amazed by Dr. Helms' story because, you know, when she came over to the world of psychology, she started challenging the use of the uh, the psychological assessment tools, you know, looking at basically the statistical soundness of them, the validity, reliability of these tests. And, you know, the way I used to say it is that those folks hated to see her coming because she knows her stuff. You know, she knows the numbers. She knows the mathematics. She knows stats very well. And she's also very much race conscious. So a salute to Dr. Uh, Janet Helms and then uh, definitely her protege, shining star Dr. Miriam Jernigan, you know, for putting in that work to help the APA come up with this uh, apology that we're going to delve into. If you can't tell, psychology is a passion of mine. Uh, I feel that no matter what major or what it is that you're interested in and what you're studying, whether you're in school or just studying on your own self-studying course, I think that psychology should be at the top of the list because psychology is that discipline, it's that field. Psychology and psychiatry are those disciplines and those fields that are literally designed to define what mental health is, right? Not only what mental health is, but also what mental illness is. And not only does it define what mental health is and what mental illness is, it also defines the ways that we determine in order to distinguish between the two, what's, what's well and what's ill. And not only that, <laughs> but it also decides on how do you approach the treatment of those that are uh, now labeled as mentally ill. And so, and not only that, but they also, we, <laughs> APA or the field of psychology also in large part determines how do you prevent mental illness from coming around and how do you maintain and sustain mental wellness. And so to have that much power, because you're literally talking about defining what's right and what's not right about human functioning, generally speaking, that's very powerful. Now, imagine that field being fueled and driven by those who have racial bias, biases or those who are just flat out racist. Right. Not only are they dealing with structural racism, but they themselves are individually racist and they're perpetuating if flex, flexing their power to perpetuate racism by way of bias and psychological testing bias and therapeutic approaches, bias and diagnosing, right? Then that's a very, very powerful tool for somebody who is as immoral as a racist would be to be able to wield and yield and to be able to utilize on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, sure, there's a code of ethics that's there to, and designed to check and balance it. But again, the rules are only as good as the consequence for breaking them. And when the system itself is designed to enforce those rules, Right. And those rules themselves are based on biases and racism. Then nobody's checking for the wrongdoing because it all seems to be right. And so, you know, again, I stand I sit before you all in the tradition of some of my my ancestors and some of the greats. And uh, I was trying to figure out the best time to do this, but I do it now. I want to shout out some of the people that came before us and just show how far psychology as a discipline has come by way of its publications and the contributions of black folks. And then I get into the APA talk, the context for the um, apology in the context for the stigma. And so one of the first books I want to share with you all, a series of books actually, is from Dr. Reginald Jones. Dr. Jones, he was, uh, I met Dr. Jones, I guess a few years before he became an ancestor, but he's one of the, I call him a master organizer. Some of y'all who are in the field of psychology recognize these books, but these are the four volumes of black psychology. These are edited volumes. And so I call Dr. Uh, Jones the master organizer because he was able to pull all kinds of psychologists together to write about black psychology, literally black perspectives on psychological theories that currently existed, but also black perspectives on new theories, new theoretical pathways and perspectives that we could take on. So he was a giant amongst giants as well. Um, of course, here's another one of his books. And I'm probably going to go through all these books. I got stacks and stacks of books on the desk, y'all. And also one of my favorites, uh, Dr. Joy DeGruy, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. Um, she's, a, she's a mother of one of my classmates as well, uh, Dr. Bahia Overton, uh, Bahia Cross. And uh, she's also in the mental health field. And we got these other three books, Dr. Faye Belgrave, African-American Psychology, uh, Human Services and Afrocentric Paragraph. This, this middle book I'll talk about in a little bit once we get into the apology stuff. And it's a very profound reason why I've got that book pulled out. Got a few more books I'm gonna share and we're gonna jump right on there, y'all. 
I also want to talk about this legendary book right here. Even the Rat Was White, A Historical View of Psychology, Robert V. Gumphrey. And this is one of the books that this is one of the seminal books you want to read when you want to look at racism as it exists in the field of psychology. So he says even the rat was white, meaning that so much of the standards of psychology is based on white norms or white people. You know, and he says even the rats were white. We got the science of melanin. This is by a good friend of mine, Dr. Tim Moore. He's a fellow Howard Bison. He's actually the chair of psychology uh, down at Clark Atlanta right now. Then we got the Manichian psychology, uh, racism in the minds of people of African descent. This is Dr. Jules Harrell. He's in the psychology department at the Howard University. He's one of my professors. And we got the legendary Kobe Cambone, African Black Psychology in the American Context, an African-centered approach. And the motivation behind these books, many of these books, is the need to challenge and push back against the racism, both in theory and in practice, that has been exhibited through psychology since its inception, right? And so a lot of these are motivated back. This Dr. Cambone, again, African personality in America. And then we got the legendary Amos Wilson, The Falsification of African Consciousness, Eurocentric History, Psychiatry, and the Politics of White Supremacy. He takes it head on as far as looking at the impact of racism and psychology uh, on the minds and behaviors of people of color. So again, this is just still building the context for why this stigma exists. We have people who have devoted their entire life and their entire professional life, personal life, private lives to the dismantling of racism and white supremacy as it relates to the field of mental health and wellness. We got, of course, Dr. Akbar. These are Akbar papers in African psychology, just a collection of his papers and writings. He's one of the original founders of the Association of Black Psychologists. And you'll see A.B. Sai mentioned in the apology as we scroll through it, because literally the founders of A.B. Sai left the American Psychological Association because of the embedded racism, right, and the practice of racism, both in theory and practice. And they left and they formed the Association of Black Psychologists as a direct challenge to the racism that existed in the American Psychological Association. Uh, this is Understanding the Afrocentric Worldview, uh, Introduction to an Optimal Psychology by the Linda James Myers. And then second to last, a, a reader, Dr. Kobe Cambone, I'm, I'm sorry, Daoudi Azibo, uh, African Psychology and Historical Perspectives and Related Commentary. And then last and definitely not least, the ISIS Papers, The Keys to the Colors by Dr. Frances Cress Wells. And she was actually a psychiatrist. So she's a, a medical doctor, physician, and she devoted her life to studying racism, and white supremacy, and how it impacts the mental health of people of color, Black people in particular. But she also did a deep analysis on why white supremacy exists in the first place. So, you know, I want to give thanks and pay homage to all of those that came before me and whose shoulders I'm standing on, who have enabled me to do the work that I do today, right? So let's jump into this APA joint. I'm going to go ahead and share this first document with you all. And it's the, it's the, it's the direct uh, apology from the APA that they issued. Um, find the tab. All right, here we go. And so you all should be seeing this. It's the actual APA apology found at the APA website. It's an apology to people of color for APA's role in promoting, perpetuating, and failing to challenge racism, racial discrimination, and human hierarchy in the U.S. And this was issued uh, or adopted on October the 29th of 2021. I'll read these first couple of paragraphs, and then uh, I'll jump down into some of the proclamation part of it. Um, and things that they're proclaiming. And then we'll jump into the actual historical timeline. So they begin by saying that the American Psychological Association failed in its role leading leading the discipline of psychology. Uh, it was complicit in contributing to system, systemic inequities and hurt many through racism, racial discrimination, and denigration of people of color, thereby falling short on its mission to benefit society and improve lives. APA is profoundly sorry, accepts responsibility for, and owns the actions and inactions of the APA itself, the discipline of psychology and individual psychologists who stood as leaders of the organization in the field. That's a big responsibility that they're accepting there, right? I mean, for the field, for the discipline of psychology, generally speaking, right? So this is a very profound statement that was being made here. Continuing on, the governing body within the APA should have apologized to people of color before today. APA and many in psychology have long considered such an apology, but failed to accept responsibility. APA previously engaged in unsuccessful efforts to issue apologies in the past, including an apology to indigenous peoples. The work done to make this apology to people of color a reality was led by the people and voices of a broad cross, of a broad cross section of today's APA members. APA's elected and appointed leaders and staff in a shared commitment to not only truly assess the harms and the harmed, but also to take responsibility and commit to taking those collective learnings and direct them into an apology that will affect true change it is informed by listening with intention to the voices of the past as outlined in the stunning chronology of psychology's history. 
and especially informed by the voices of today, the lived experiences of psychologists of color, ethnic psychological association, and those who serve people of color. All right, and quickly, just a couple more paragraphs. Consistent with this February 2021 commitment to catalog the long history of harms to people of color and to inform an apology and a path forward toward healing and reconciliation, APA commissioned historical research by the Cummings Center of, this, of the uh, History of Psychology at the University of Akron. Uh, in addition, recognizing that many existing historical records and narratives have been centered in whiteness, APA also concluded that it was imperative to capture oral history and the lived experiences of communities of color, so commissioned a series of listening sessions and surveys, which also informed his resolution by Jernigan and Associates Consulting. That's Dr. Miriam Jernigan I was speaking about earlier. Uh, the narrative that emerged from the listening session, surveys and historical findings put into stark amplification the impact of well-known and lesser known actions. It leaves us as APA leaders, them as APA leaders, with profound regret and deep remorse for the long-term impact of their failures as an association, a discipline, and as individual psychologists. We know too well that history can repeat itself, that the past informs the present, and that many harms will continue to be perpetuated absent purposeful intervention. And offer an apology for these harms, APA acknowledges that re recognition and apology only ring true when accompanied by action. By not only bringing awareness to the past and to the present, but in acting to ensure reconciliation, repair, and renewal, we stand committed to purposeful intervention and to ensuring that APA, the field of psychology, and individual psychologists are leaders in both benefiting society and improving lives. So I'm going to scroll down and just look at some of these whereas. We might just look at a couple of these, then I'll jump into the chronology. So this first one, whereas psychology cannot harness its potential to disarm and dismantle racism without addressing its own history of racism and support for human hierarchy. Since its origins as a scientific discipline in the mid 19th century, psychology has through acts of commission and omission, meaning they've done things and, they've, and they haven't done things, contributed to the dispossession, displacement and exploitation of communities of color. This early history of psychology rooted in oppressive psychological science to protect whiteness, white people and white epistemologies reflected the social and political landscape of the U.S. at that time. Psychology developed under these conditions, helped to create, express, and sustain them, continues to bear their indelible imprint, and often continues to publish research that, confirm, that conforms with white racial hierarchy. Let me let me go ahead and stop the share real quick. You know, because we don't really have to read a whole, whole lot of that. It's a lot of profound statements in the brief, in the brief reading that I've done. And it's enough for us to kind of understand better, like, why does this stigma exist? Why is it that Black people avoid, people of color in general, but Black people specifically avoid seeking out mental health services. And the way that the statements are written, you don't really get a clear picture of what actually happened, right? You don't get a clear picture of the details of what took place. The chronology helps us with that, but still it's, it's kind of like a, it's almost like if you've ever been to the uh, El Mina Castle or Cape Coast, what they call Cape Coast Castle and El Mina Castle in Ghana, where they actually uh, captured, Af uh, shipped out, captured Africans and enslaved Africans to go off into the slave trade, uh, they're, they're very much polished and cleaned up now. And the fact that they call them castles, when in fact they were dungeons and holding pens. I, that's the same way I kind of feel about the way that the apology is crafted, because it leaves out a lot of the detail. And it probably couldn't fit in there anyway, but the detail that's missing them help us to really understand what it was that psychology did to harm people and what psychology did not do to prevent from being harmed. And so when you look at like the, the trauma, the transgenerational trauma that people have experienced at the hands of psychology, at the hands of psychiatry, at the hands of psychologists, you know, then you get a better understanding like, wow, this is really profound stuff, right? This is the reason why, you know, people are afraid and we should be on many levels. If history as a, as the statement made, as the statement was made, history can be repeated. And then even in modern times, we still get a lot of psychological and scientific racism to come out in the psychological literature. <clears throat> I'll never forget, but I was working as a clinician in D.C. and I was doing assessments and I was getting a lot of young people coming you know, to get their, their updated evaluations. And many of their psychological evaluations were labeled as they had diagnoses of ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder or ADD, attention deficit disorder or they had uh, opposition of defiant disorder or some form of a conduct disorder. And all of these children had experienced major traumas in their life, literally the disruption of their biological family. And not only was I noticing this consistent diagnosis, but I also noticed that a lot of their IQs were very, very low. And so it was my job just to reevaluate them, not to challenge the previous assessment, but to give them a new assessment. And what would happen is that my assessment would yield the IQ, for example, 
would yield higher IQ, IQ scores than was previous measured, previously measured. And so like let's, many of the children were like in the 70s range, uh, you know, which is the which is the IQ range that's necessary or as a part of the diagnosis for some type of mental retardation or some type of learning disability. Right. And so a lot of them hovered right around 70 IQ. But when I when I evaluated them, their IQs was right around 100. They were right around average. And it was literally to the point where people thought that that was making some type of mistake in my evaluation. But what I've come to learn, and it was built into the philosophy of the organization, is that when the, when the client or your patient can relate to you, right, then in relating to you, they're more likely to perform to their potential because they don't feel like they're being tested and that I expect them to fail. And there's a lot of literature on how teacher expectation impacts child or student performance. And it's the same in a clinical setting, right, on the IQ test or even when you talk about therapy. People are more likely to comply and participate and even perform to their maximum potential when they feel some type of connection with the person that's there evaluating or, or, or administering the therapy, right? And so I found that to be true so much that the IQ scores were growing by 30 points on average, and IQ doesn't change by 30 points, generally speaking. So there had to be something wrong. And then when I looked into who did the previous evaluations, you know, typically they were not black people. In fact, it was consistently a white person. Right. And so what I understood is that the relationship that the individual felt is what helped them to relax and to perform better on these on these tests. I mean, they would monitor me behind the two way mirror and everything. And so I was doing everything right. It was just a function of who was administering the test and how that made the, uh, the client feel. And so, you know, when you look at that example and you look at how much harm was being done with all these ADHD diagnoses, these conduct disorder diagnoses, and then the treatment that follows that. A misdiagnosis leads to mistreatment almost every time because the treatment is based on the diagnosis. So if the diagnosis is wrong, then the treatment got to be wrong, right? Well, it ain't got to be. Sometimes you get lucky and do something that works anyway, even if the problem is wrong. But that's very rare. It's almost like if you go out, God forbid, and your car doesn't start. And there's a dude standing up under a shade tree chewing on a wheat stalk. And he's, oh, it ain't nothing but your starter, right? And really, you out of gas. But you're, he's misdiagnosed your vehicle. Now you're doing everything to get the starter to work. And that's never going to help you because you need gas in your tank. Right. It's kind of similar to that. And so when I would see these kids misdiagnosed with ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, some type of conduct disorder, some type of uh, mood disorder, and I understood what their trauma was, I was able to do an assessment and put the proper instruments in there to properly assess them. And I found out that they were still just reacting perpetually to the trauma that they had experienced which is a whole nother diagnosis with a whole nother treatment protocol. And so when I gave them another diagnosis, we had to take them off of the previous treatment protocol, which oftentimes in included some type of medication for the ADHD. I had plenty of kids tell me that when they were, <clears throat> when they were on the medications, that they felt like zombies. They didn't feel like themselves. They didn't like being on those medications. And so one of the things that I would have to help them to do is, well, we realized that they weren't on the meds during the summertime, which was great. And I told them, it gives, we got an opportunity in the summer for me to help you to control your behavior, to recognize your behavior, you know, and take charge of your life. So then when the school year begins, we can hold off or get you back on the medicine at the beginning. And then you can demonstrate you don't need it anymore. And hopefully we can keep you off of it now. So I taught them self-regulation, self-monitoring and, uh, you know, self-discipline. Right. And I did that with part by infusing cultural pride into them, which is something that racism took out. So I'm, I'm telling you all of this stuff is just to give kind of like an idea of how when you have that bias that's built into a system, the system becomes very harmful, both observably harmful and subtly harmful to the people who are uh, dependent on that system, you know, for their well-being. And so uh, uh, Dr. Harriet Washington, she has a book called Medical Apartheid, which is another book that I strongly recommend that you all read. And it, it details uh, cycle, it, 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 it details racism in the medical field. And you get to see how all of the different experimentations that took place on black people occurred, how they were set up, how they were systematically OK and approved, uh, how, you know, how they gave, got away with some very heinous and wicked stuff. That's a part of why the stigma exists. That's a part of why people want to avoid, you know, going to mental health services. Right. That's one of the parts. Another one is, of course, the cultural and the social aspect. And it's, it's because, you know, born out of the idea that these folks can do harm to you. And we have a record to show that harm has been done. Not only that, but then people would also look at you crazy, like you're crazy, right? Look at you crazy, like you're crazy. And in that, you know, there's kind of like a, a shunning of you. Uh, Cause it's not like having a broken arm or uh, having diabetes or something to that effect. You know, it's nothing that's, not, oftentimes it's nothing that's tangible there that can show why this mental health disorder exists. And so people kind of stay away from people 
or who sh uh, shun people who have had mental illnesses, basically from a lack of understanding. You know, so it's kind of the stigma is kind of twofold. And it, it's important for us to understand as much of it as possible. So then one, with that understanding, we ourselves will be more likely to what be friendly to the receiving mental health services, as well as being accommodating to those that we know who actually need them and encouraging and supporting people on that walk towards mental health and wellness. Right. Uh, so really quickly, let me jump into this next chronology. I'm just going to point out a couple of things on this chronology. Then I got a quick video I'm going to show you just to show you how the, the institutional racism that it exists, you know, globally, how it impacts us psychologically. And I'm going to show you it's a re reenactment of some of the doll studies. Uh, so we should see. Okay, cool. All right, let me uh, pull this up really quickly so I can show you all this chronology, and then we'll come back, chat for a second about that, and then I'll show you this video to give us some of the uh, direct experience of racism, see how, how it plays out. <clears throat> and you'll see the starter a long time ago. We're talking back to the 1800s. What are we looking at? 1869? So 1850 to 1900, the formal inst institutionalization of U.S. psychology, uh, as, as indicated by the creation of programs, departments, degrees, societies, and schools, occurred in the years around, surrounding the Civil War, centered on national debates about slavery. The passing of Indian Appropriations Act, which removed first peoples from the tribal lands to government reservations, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which suspended Chinese immigration, and the Supreme Court's Plessy versus Ferguson decision, which held the segregation laws, did not violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. The formalized psychology established uh, established at this time was led primarily by white men and leaned heavily on the evolutionary theory with its emphasis on survival and adaptation to the, of the species. The field almost immediately lent its support to the notion of white superiority with its focus on different racial groups. Now, one thing I would like to say at this point is a couple of things. One, there are differences amongst racial groups. We can't deny that. In fact, what you'll notice in some of this chronology some of the earlier differences that they discovered was that black children and black people would perform su more superior than white people also being tested. And so what would happen is that in true racist fashion, they would spin the interpretation of those differences. So oftentimes they would attribute uh, the reflexive, the, like the reflex superiority demonstrated by black people. They would say that that was because uh, the more primitive brain and that white people were more thoughtful, therefore less reactive and less reflective when it comes to responding to things. So it was always something that even if black people support to, uh, performed in a, in a superior fashion, it was spun as if to say it was because of a primitive brain and they didn't have higher order thinking, which would be required and, you know, which, which is what white people were using, which slowed down certain processes for them. Uh, there's a book by, uh, uh, I think she was an anthropologist from Johns Hopkins up in Baltimore, uh, Mary Ainsworth. It's called uh, Infancy in Uganda. And part of her study, she was looking at attachment styles. And some of the uh, information and data that came from her work was that uh, the African babies that she would observe were far more advanced than the European babies that she had also uh, 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 observed previously. And they were superior by way of their physical development, holding up their head longer, uh, earlier, uh, making eye contact with adults, you know, responding to their name, even the fact that they were potty trained, you know, the babies would be strapped onto their mother's backs. And, you know, these are young, young babies now. And they, would, they wouldn't soil their mother. They wouldn't go to the bathroom on their mother's back. Mother would unwrap them, put them down, you know, hold them over a hole or whatever they was using the bathroom in. They'd go to the bathroom, put them back on the back. And so it was an advancement in development that was identified and recognized not only by Ainsworth's work, but also by many of these early psychological studies that were being uh, implemented. But not Eric, not Ainsworth work, but in the psychological work, again, the spin that was put on it was to make it seem like it was just a primitive brain and that uh, blacks and Africans were still inferior. And even if they scored superior on these particular measures, it was it was nothing to it's nothing to be worried about because they don't intellect. They are intellectually superior to white people. Right. And so you'll see this whole timeline is full of stuff like that. Uh, founded by G. Stanley Hall. And here's the other point I want to make uh, by G. Stanley Hall as the president and 31 white males. And so what you'll find in the apology in several places, they want it's almost like they, they, they made sure to emphasize that these were not only white people, but they were my, white males specifically. And that for me gave me pause. I said, why would they emphasize males? And what, what I came back with was just, you know, to almost excuse, you know, white women at the time who were heavy into this game as well. Right. When you look at like the eugenics movement, you know, there were plenty of white women that were part of the eugenicist movement. 
which again was about the racial purity and weeding out the undesirables, right? And so a uh, Margaret Sanger, matter of fact, from Planned Parenthood was associated with uh, the eugenics movement in one way or the other, although there's controversy about whether she was or not. I've seen people argue on both sides of that. You know, the part that I've seen is that she was affiliated with it in some way, shape or form. And in fact, Hitler was inspired, you know, by, you know, Sanger and U.S. racism. Right. And so, you know, it's not here nor there beyond the scope of this particular presentation. But the point I want to make is that there's an emphasis on men, just like on this 1892 entry. <clears throat> it's G. Stanley Hall and 31 white males elected. There's this book that exists out called. Uh, they were her property. And it talks about white women plantation owners or a property owner or white women who own slaves or enslaved Africans in the South. Uh, that's a part of the story that's often overlooked. It's a part of the story that's rarely emphasized that, you know, the participation of white women in racism and white supremacy. And so just because they're highlighting men does not mean that they did not have women supporting them as well. That's very important. And when you think about like today, the modern classroom today, it's majority majority of teachers are white female teachers. And so that's a whole nother conversation about the school to prison pipeline, the implicit biases that these teachers exhibit, uh, how they focus on the behavior problems of the children, which then makes school the source of punishment. Any healthy human being wants to what avoid punishment and gravitate towards pleasure. Right. And reward. And so when school becomes a source of punishment, children typically mentally check out. Right. And that's the performance that impacts performance. And then, you know, D Dr. Juwan Sikajufa told us years ago that they build prison, you know, beds based on uh, performance in the third or fourth grade, right? And so all of these things are intertangled and intertwined. But let's go down, let's go down this chart a little bit, to this timeline a little bit. Uh, so here's 1897. That's one thing I talked about, the memory tasks. In 1897, a study of black and white children by Stetson found that black children outperform white children on memory tasks. The author attributed this to the gender, uh, to, I'm sorry, to the greater mnemonic ability of their primitive brains. He further described black children as being deficient in reasoning. So he would say that, <laughs> that children, black children are better able to remember, you know, due to greater mnemonic memory abilities of their primitive brain, meaning, and they also had a deficiency in reasoning. So he's saying that they were, while they were great at memorizing stuff through the ability to repeat patterns and things of that nature, they were inferior in their reasoning abilities, right? And so this is the type of stuff that was happening. Again, this is why the stigma exists, because if the foundation is this, then what you find on the back end of it is what? The perpetuation of it, because you got to remember that these are the people that taught the people that taught the people who taught the people who are currently practicing today. And a lot of it is the same. Uh, it's the same standard. A lot of the same attitudes exist. And it's so deeply ingrained that people may or may not be conscious of it. I'm not the type that, that excuses it with implicit bias saying that, it's there and they're not aware of it. Some maybe, and some of it maybe, but nobody's totally ignorant to all of it. You know, it's just a luxury to not have to focus on it. Uh, let me scroll down and pull up some more. Here's some more about the eugenics board. Uh, the eugenics record office is established. Uh, they have a very tight relationship with psychology. Uh, through these particular groups, they promote uh, sterilization initiatives for unfit and inferior races. So again, this goes beyond just an attitude, but these are actual actions life-altering actions like again sterilizing people uh they supported race-based immigration policies and negative her her heredity laws psychological tests were regularly used in the work of these organizations between 1892 and 1947 31 presidents of apa acted in leadership positions in eugenics organizations during their time as president but also in the years surrounding their presidencies right so again hand in hand psych psychology and eugenics dealing with sterilization of people giving people lobotomies, all type of heinous crimes against people. So again, the stigma is warranted, right? There is reason for the stigma. Let me jump out of this and let's go to this video really quickly so that you can see a modern example of how it impacts us, right? And then we'll jump into how to deal with the stigma now and some ways to overcome the stigma so we can encourage people to actually seek mental health services because it is important. We need more culturally competent mental health providers and we definitely need more providers of color, right? And we'll talk about that briefly when I, after we come out of this video. Okay, pull up this video. And some of you may have seen this already. It's a girl like me, Kiri Davis. She reenacted the doll studies of Kenneth and uh, Mamie Phipps Clark. I believe that. Or even when, also when I was younger, like, Say there was there was 
I don't know, a doll. I used to have a lot of dolls, but most of them were just white dolls with long straight hair that I would comb and I would be like, oh, I wish I was just like this Barbie doll. In Brown versus Board of Education, the famous case that desegregated schools in the 1950s, Dr. Kenneth Clark conducted a doll test with black children. He asked them to choose between a black doll and a white doll. In most instances, the majority of the children preferred the white doll. I decided to reconduct this test as Dr. Clark did to see how we've progressed since then. Can you show me the doll that you like best or that you'd like to play with? This one. I like that one. I can't. This one. That one? This one. I like to play with this. And can you show me the doll that is the nice doll? And why is that the nice doll? She's white. And can you show me the doll that looks bad? Okay. And can you give, and why does that look bad? Because it's black. Hmm. And why do you think that's a nice doll? Because she's white. And can you give me the doll that looks like you? I'm gonna stop that right there. Now, one of the most profound parts of this recreation of Dr. Clark's study is that point right there. If you all saw the, the dissonance that the little sister was experiencing when she was told, after she had labeled the white doll nice and good and the black doll bad and all that stuff, then she said, now show me which one looks like you. The little sister, she was shook. I don't know if y'all saw it, but she was shook. She touched the white doll first. And she said, dang, I don't look like that doll. Hey, I'm the bad, ugly one. And she had to identify herself with all the negative things that she had just identified with her own race. And so that's how deep this stuff goes. And those are babies, right? Um, and there's another, there's another clip that I, that I thought about showing, but I'm not going to show it, but uh, it was a uh, Black History Lost, Hidden, or Stolen, or something like that. But it's an old school Bill Cosby video clip to where he was talking about uh, human picture, human figure drawings. It's one of the projective measures that we actually use in psychology. And how you could actually use that to show embedded racism within non-white people. And so it just shows how deep this stuff goes. And, and it all contributes to our stigma and our reluctancy to seek mental health services. It's deeply ingrained, y'all. And, you know, it's, it's a lot to work through. But one of the number one things that we could do is to have more conversations like this one. Right. And uh, to, to discuss these things openly, to discuss, you know, in this entire series, you point out the, the necessity of mental health, uh, uh, mental, getting mental health checkups, uh, looking into mental illnesses and seeking help and all these other things. And so this is a wonderful series and discussions like the ones that are held in this series are what help people to become more relaxed and more informed about what psychological services actually are. What does it mean to be mental health, uh, to, uh, to, to seek out mental health assistance? What does it mean to be mentally ill? What are the broad ranges of mental illnesses? Because, you know, having a mental illness does not necessarily mean that you're psychotic. You know, that is a type of mental illness, but a mental illness could be depression, right? It could be anxiety, you know, which are not psych those, those are not psychotic disorders. You know, those are mood disorders that deal with how you feel literally, right? And of course, they have their behavior and their cognitive aspects to them. But, you know, just having a mental illness does not necessarily mean that you're psychotic. It doesn't mean that you are out of touch with reality always. There are some that are that way. Sometimes psychological disorders are, are behavior disorders where you have like, you know, you have eating disorders, you have nervous tics. Everything doesn't necessarily mean that you are totally dysfunctional. Matter of fact, most people who experience mental illnesses are totally functional. You know, they function every day, all day, you know, in and out of life, in and out of work, in and out of uh, personal uh, social environments. And you would never know it. Right. And so that's a part of breaking the stigma as well as dealing with increasing knowledge and awareness about what mental health issues actually are. Uh, there are plenty, plenty of organizations out there. The Association of Black Psychologists, one, uh, as I mentioned earlier, which is actually uh, a group of grad students and some professors were at the APA convention in California. They literally walked out of the convention and started the uh, Association of Black Psychologists right then and there on the spot in order to challenge, to have an organized body to systematically challenge the racism that was being exhibited 
through the American Psychological Association, American Psychiatric Association, and the practicing of mental uh, of, the, of the field of mental health uh, uh, psychotherapy and other psychological fields. And so AB Psy is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful organization for anybody who's a mental health provider who wants to develop cultural competency, become a part of a body that normalizes the discussion of Black people and mental health. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful organization. It's been around uh, since 1970, if I'm not mistaken. So we're like 53 years at this point. A wonderful, beautiful organization full of giants, beautiful people. Many of the people whose books I shared with y'all at the beginning. Uh, but then you also have organizations like the uh, Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation. I'm on the uh, an advisor, clinical advisory board there. And one of the things that we do there is we have a, a cultural competency training protocol that has been developed uh, that deals with increasing and improving cultural competency of practicing therapists. And of course, that's the organization founded by Taraji P. Henson. It's her mental health foundation. Um, so you can go there and get your cultural competency training on. Uh, if you all know mental health specialists, suggest that they go over and take this training so they can improve their understanding of uh, black lives, right? Uh, black minds and black experience, if whether they're black or not, right? Um, they also, uh, Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation also periodically and cyclically gives away free therapy sessions by providing the funding to mental health service providers to treat people free of cost free of charge to the people who are receiving treatment. So these are ways that we can help to improve. And a, a large percentage of the people who take who, uh, at, who get the therapy via the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation are getting therapy for the first time, right? And it's because part of it is because it's coming through a black organization. Many of the service providers are black and almost all, I don't know everybody, but I can say almost all uh, have some degree of cultural competency, right? That goes above and beyond the typical standard day-to-day -day, uh, service provider. One other major thing that we could do is we can support uh, academic programs and institutions that turn uh, that, that produce large numbers of uh, mental health majors. Right. So, for example, if you got a school of social work, Howard has psychology, social work, uh, they have clinical psychology, counseling, psychology, right, uh, neuropsychology. So if we have programs at institutions that uh, produce black mental health majors or graduates majoring in black mental health or mental health uh, sciences. We need to support those organizations and figure out how we to support those students to go from gaining their degree to actually getting licensed and practicing, right? Or in some other way con contributing to the understanding and the dissemination of information and actually the practicing of culturally competent psychology as it relates to Black populations. That's another way to decrease the stigma. Uh, one of the things that that I do is uh, start adding comment. Okay, one one of the things that I do. Um, when I'm, you know, I train a lot of professionals. I train a lot of mental health professionals, uh, uh, <clears throat> lawyers, the people in the legal field, on, you know, from psycholo from a psychological perspective, and also work in academia. But one of the one of the things I do is I purposely give quote unquote permission to those of us, you know, practitioners of colors, to put that swag on your profession. Meaning, you know, go on and sprinkle some seasoning on it. Don't leave yourself outside of the therapy room. Don't leave yourself out of the evaluation. Right. Bring your full self into it so that the person that you're working with connects with you on a human level. Right. I'm saying keep all your ethical protocols in place. Absolutely. But you want to make sure that you are connecting with people as people. Uh, Progressive Life Center right in D.C., you know, down in Chocolate City, uh, what in Chocolate City, all through Maryland, had offices in Ghana. But Progressive Life Center is a social service agency and they've got their own uh, approach to psychological services and developing a psychological understanding. It's called Into the letters NTU. And they've got these principles and into that speaks to the core, to the soul of black people, right? To the souls of black folks. And they do it in such a way that it shows you how as human beings and as black people, people of color, we don't have to perpetuate and uphold the models that have been given to us by white people who developed psychology back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, right? But we have permission to be ourselves and to do this thing the way that we do it, right? And so rather than being a stale and boring session, it could be something that's very dynamic and very engaging. And that helps people to what? Relax, help people to connect, and therefore help people to adhere to the process and, and, and to be empowered along the lines of their own healing. Uh, let me see what we got. 750. All right, so we 750 on the dot right here. Um, I, hopefully we're going to get into some Q&A. We got time for a couple, couple questions, if any questions are coming through. Uh, but I would love to engage in some level of dialogue or question and answering about anything that I've said or if anything was brought to mind based on something that I said, or if you want me to elaborate on something, 
Even if you want to challenge me on something, it's all good with me. We did have a couple of questions. I'm going to read a, a few. So yeah. one that came in was, Dr. Mincy, uh, Mincy, how do we eradicate the stigma in our own families? Mm, eradicate. So that's that's the thing is like a lot of people do actually feel pressure from family members. And a lot of people will conceal the fact that they're feeling mentally unwell from their family because they're afraid of the judgment that the family would impose upon them. Uh, one, one thing that you can do is you can help to educate the family member. Not that it's your burden or your responsibility to do that, right? Because you shouldn't have to do that if you're somebody who needs help. Uh, but if you are aware that the stigma exists and that pressure exists from your family members, uh, you can just share information with them, right? You can spark up a conversation with them. Like, have you ever had a time in your life when you felt like overwhelmed? You ever had a time where you dealt with depression or where you thought that, you know, you was losing your mind, nervous breakdown? You know, have those real conversations with your family members because I guarantee, I guarantee if they're telling the truth, they're going to acknowledge that. Well, yeah, I did have times when I had felt like overwhelmed in the world. Yeah. As a matter of fact, grandma and them had a nervous breakdown. I'll never forget. Da, 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 da. And then what you do is you bring in this, the, the, the experience and the mental health issues to the real world without those labels of mental health issues. You're doing it in everyday talk. And by doing that, and after they come, after they come to terms with what they just disclosed to you, it's like, ah, so why didn't you seek therapy for that? Girl, we don't do that. Boy, we don't do that therapy stuff. Well, why not? Man, you can't trust those people. You go in there, they put you, they dope you up. They da, 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 da. And I said, we got a doctor of pharmacy in here. Since I'm not, I'm not <laughs> talking bad <laughs> about the profession at all. Uh, but it's just a part of the game. You know, we've, you know, mental, mental health services, psychiatry, psychology has been weaponized against black people. And so and it's weaponized against us so much that we now are self-checked. You know, it can fall back because the job has been done and we'll do it to ourselves at this point, uh, which is a psychological technique, actually. So anyway, have those open conversations and maybe in an indirect way to where the person you're talking to don't even realize you're talking to them about their own experiences with mental health issues. So after they agree to having these experiences and knowing somebody had these experiences and you can talk about well, what did you do to resolve it? A lot of us are dependent on stuff like pastoral counseling. You know, pastoral counseling, it works for how it works. But unless that pastor is clinically trained, uh, psychologically trained, it's only so much they can do. And, and really, that's just like spiritually motivating you. Right. It, you know, it maybe make you feel good and can quote some scripture for you. You know, scripture is wonderful. It's beautiful. But it ain't the same as therapy. Right. And so we have to. And so it's a beautiful thing. To, uh, the, the, the chair of psychology up at Bowie State University right now, uh, uh, Dr. Otis, <laughs> that's my dude. Uh, he's actually a Howard graduate as well, right? And so he, they just started a PhD program in counseling psychology. Uh, uh, but they also have a pastoral counseling program that's opening up to where they're going to take pastors through the counseling psychology training so they can have a master's in psychology, counseling psychology at the same time that they are doing the, uh, the pastoral counseling. So they're going to get the clinical training at the same time. But this is what we need to do. You know, talk to your family members in a roundabout way, indirect way about the, the stresses, depression, the anxiety, feeling overwhelmed, nervous breakdowns, uh, you know, even feeling like they're about to lose their mind up in here. Right. Those types of conversations help people to relate to it, makes it more tangible, drops all the fancy labels and it brings it to the forefront. And that, that should help out a lot. OK, we had another question. How do we make impact as providers in the black communities with these biases in mind? I know you spoke about, you know, bringing your full self um, to your profession as a way of connecting. But what other tips or do you have any other tips that may be helpful? Yeah, um, getting getting and thanks for the questions, y'all. Um, becoming involved with organizations uh, of like minded people, people who are, aren't afraid to talk about the cultural relevancy of psychological practice, right? Who aren't afraid to put, you know, race to the forefront of the conversation. Uh, so organizations like the Association of Black Psychologists, uh, organizations such as the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation, who has a uh, mental health providers guide and has ongoing trainings and support groups for, for, for black providers, right? So when you join groups like that and, you know, think tanks like that, you start connecting with other people. Not only do you feel more empowered in your approach to your own work, you know, but you also have this support network, too, because the thing about it is a lot of times those of us who are in this line of work, we get so caught up in helping other people, we forget to help ourselves. Right. And so having that type of supportive community around you can empower you in your day to day work as well, because it, it reminds you to, you know, put your mask on first. 
right? Just like you're on an airplane. You'd be trying to, and I call it being seduced by the external. I warn my grad students about it all the time. I say, look, y'all, I know you're going to get out here. You probably can help your friend with this and help your friend with that, help your cousin in with that. And then you forget that you was in here to help yourself. And so you get seduced by the external. You get seduced by the ability to help other people that you forget to help yourself. And now you running around here, you know, all twisted and all jacked up in your personal life. But you look real good out there helping them other people, <laughs> you know. And so, you know, it's a part of that process when you're in a group of people and a collective of people that's there to support you. And that you don't have to apologize for your blackness. You don't have to apologize for your swag. In fact, you're with a group of people who hopefully are constantly helping you to refine your blackness and your swag because it's too many. It's, I know I know people that are crack addicted that quote unquote keep it real, you know. But it's like, is that how you want to keep it real? You're keeping it really that, but you could keep it really something better too. So that constant growth and refinement. So if you associate and affiliate yourself with organizations that are, you know, unapologetically black, you know, that's that's very beneficial. And they should also be an organization that's constantly pushing you to enhance yourself, to improve yourself as a person so that any and everything that you do, including your practice, is enhanced and improved by your improvement. I hope I, like I answered that. question. And I was taking pictures of your 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 catalog, your book recommendations yeah. because they were all very good recommendations and right reading about some of that research is important to as a, for a provider as well yes all right we have um one more question oh two more questions how do we encourage um black people to engage in mental health research so that we can learn more about black mental health great question um because a lot of us shy away from research and because a lot of times research is is analogous to experimentation. And again, we sh we shy away from that level of being manipulated. And so those of us on the scholarly side of it, the academic side or the professional side of it, you know, a lot of times we will avoid research as well because, you know, we hate stats, you know, going through stats, stats class. You know, there's a there's a few of us that, that love stats, like one of my elders, Dr. Serge Madeira, he's, he's a Haitian brother. Uh, he taught he taught up at Howard. You know, he's a brilliant statistician. And one of his protégés, Dr. Kimberly Bell, another Howard Bison, she's down teaching at North Carolina a t right now. She's a brilliant statistician too. Me, not so much. But what helped me to be able to delve into that science, one, being amazed by Dr. Madeer and Dr. Bell and Dr. Jules Harrell, these other, Dr. Janet Helms, these other statisticians who are hardcore research scientists, you know, being amazed by them and watching how how much swag they got in that world. But then also understand, like, wow, all research doesn't have to be that. You know, some research is uh, is is qual qual uh, qualitative, you know, to where you're not necessarily crunching numbers. You know, you're interviewing people like Dr. Du Bois and the Philadelphia Negro. And he went door to door interviewing people. And that is a nice body of research that exists to help us to understand black lives in the inner city. And so part of what what I needed to do was understand that research isn't just this. It's not just crunching numbers. SPSS spreadsheets and data analysis and all that type of stuff. Research is also gathering information and data from people's lived day-to-day -day experiences. And so I'm more of that phenomenological type of research where I deal more qualitatively. I can't crunch the numbers, but that's not my thing. So I'll go in and get the primary resources where I'll go down to the Library of Congress and I will pull up Kenneth Clark's files, you know, and see all of his documents and handwritten notes or you know, collecting Dr. Francis Chris Wells and papers where she passed for her sister. You know, so more of the primary research type of uh, 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 research, right? Primary source research. Uh, my second book was a collection of J.A. Rogers papers to where I found at Fisk University, we had his papers in, in these boxes, his handwritten travel notes, travel journals. His brother traveled the world talking about the black, the African presence in Europe, you know, in European nations like Russia, the African presence in China. And so he was writing for the uh, the Pittsburgh Courier and the most he was writing for all kind of black <laughs> black publications back in the 1919s, I mean, the 19 teens and the 20s and the 30s. And so he was writing back all of these beautiful black people and archives that he was finding all over the world, sending it back to Harlem. You know, just for the uh, uh, what is it? The new the Amsterdam News, New York Amsterdam News or something to that effect. Sending it back. He was just sending these articles back and just blowing people's minds with the African presence around the world. He actually was at Emperor Haile Selassie's coronation when he became emperor in 1930. This dude was a Pullman porter. <laughs> he started off as a Pullman porter from Jamaica, you know, and did all of this research. So the more that we can understand that research is beyond the dry, analytical, data-driven discipline and understand that research is gathering and reporting information in any way that you can. 
then it opens up and gives us permission to have fun and to enjoy it and pick topics that are relevant to us and even beyond what the funders are saying that they're currently funding. Right. I love it. Uh, last question. Um, Dr. Mincy, are you observing barriers for as as aspiring Black practitioners to education, licensing, and training? And if so, how can we address these systematic issues? Yeah, great question. So when you, you're talking about being it, because, you know, to, to practice as a mental health specialist, most times you act, you need at least a master's degree, you know, for licensure and things of that nature. You could get certified on a bachelor's level and, you know, like do like programs with organizations and stuff like that, like counselor, camp counselor, or running rites of passage programs, stuff like that. But to actually practice, you have to need a master's in social work, MSW, you know, you're going to need an MS or MA in psychology, counseling or clinical. So, yeah, so a lot of times getting into these programs, it's very difficult. Uh, I didn't know how difficult it was to get to a clinical program until I was already in. And I'm glad I didn't know what the stats were, you know, because that could have been that could have deterred me from doing it. I had no idea. I just did it. I said, I'm, I'm going to Howard. I only applied to Howard and God and ancestors willing. I got in. Right. But it's very difficult a lot of times to get into these programs. Uh, you have hundreds of applications and maybe 10 to get in. And, you know, and HBCUs, again, are, are beacons of hope for this type of training because you not only get into a nurturing environment, you know, most of the time for most people, but you're also in an environment that's going to support you through the process. And then once you get through the process, hopefully you will be prepared as long as you put in the work to actually sit for those licensure examinations, right? Uh, we have access to resources like internships and externship, externship programs. But to answer the question directly, yes, I have observed those barriers. Uh, they exist. Uh, I hear some of my colleagues who, you know, who caught heck going through some of these other programs and, you know, People oftentimes will get sick through grad school, grad school because of the stress. Um, you know, people sitting for licensure exams over and over and over again and failing them. And it costs money every time you take it. So the financial burden is there. Uh, and then the other thing is about it. And one of my teachers said it a long time ago. She said that oftentimes what you're being tested on is how you can mimic a white man's thinking. <clears throat> and it's like, wow. Case in point, when I was administering IQ tests, you know, the children from inner city over in Southeast DC, right? And I said, I didn't say Southeast, I said Southeast, right? So I mean, you know, administering these IQ tests to kids from Southeast and, you know, the test is outdated now, so I could talk about this particular prompt, but I would show them a picture and there would be something missing in the picture and they would have to tell me what's missing in the picture. So at one point there was a door and the, you know, the proper answer is supposed to be like the hinge. And this is an old, old test. And so the hinge, but the kids are looking at it like, ain't no peephole. That's a zero point response. I'm like, Psh, that's a hundred. <laughs> Dead right, ain't no peephole. <laughs> you need to see who knocking at your door. You ain't gonna just open it, right? And then they're like, where the extra locks at? There ain't even no other locks. I suppose they had three locks on that door. It wasn't nothing but a knob on there. So these kids are answering appropriately. They should get points for these responses, but they can't because the test is built not for people in the hood, Cause they like, if the door is staying up, then even if I don't see another hinge there, it's got to be something holding it up or else it will fall over that type of thinking. I say it's prompting, uh, they supposed to guess what I'm talking about. I say, uh, these light up in the sky at night. They like, they like fireflies, helicopters, street lights, <laughs> you know, but the, the highest points are for stars. You ain't seeing stars in the hood. You got, you got too much light pollution. You know what I mean? You got too many street lights, those yellow lights and, all kind of, you know, helicopter like these kids are brilliant, but the tests don't necessarily aren't designed to measure their brilliance. And so the same thing is when you get on these professional levels and trying to pass these professional exams to get your license. So this this burden does exist is not an excuse. We can't pass the test. And many of us, many, many of us do. But I do see people getting hem hemmed up in that process. And so, again, what I've come to understand is that when you go into a journey of self-knowledge, Right. When you aren't afraid to study more deeply your ancestral legacy and heritage beyond our reaction and response to racism, then what you find is that you've got this DNA of greatness within you. And just acknowledging that gives self-confidence and it gives you a little bit more pride in your approach. And then you can call on you know, all those that did it before you to walk this walk before you and rest assured that you can actually do this as well. And when you're on the other side of that journey, you begin to look back at these little gatekeeping uh, these gatekeeper systems and protocols, and you you see them as they're pretty weak, actually. You know, you just got to do what you need to do on the front end to prepare for them. You pass them, and then the world is yours. Well, I just, 
Oh, sorry. sorry. If, I emphasize, if I didn't emphasize that, HBCUs. <laughs> <laughs> HU. All right. <laughs> you know. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. You have given me uh, knowledge I, that I didn't know, and I'm excited for the people who have joined us tonight. This was really interesting, and I love the way that we also talked about now what do we do? We acknowledge it. Now what do we do? How can we change it? So thank you so much, Dr. Jeff, for being a speaker with us today. Uh, thank you to all the participants who joined us. Uh, we thank you and we hope that you'll join us next time. Uh, I want to give a shout out in closing to our vice president, Tracy Harrison, and her leadership with the program uh, as our program chair. Um, thank you so much. And also the committee, all the committee members who are were able to join us today. Thank you so much. Next month, which will be on September 26th, we will be uh, we will be um, presenting on suicide prevention. September is suicide prevention month. And so we're going to talk about knowing the facts and how it can save a life. Um, people don't realize, but 45,000 people die each year as a result of suicide. And um, there used to be a myth in the Black community that Black people don't die by suicide. And it's unfortunate to say, but Black youths are the um, highest growing rate of suicide in the last two years. And so we want to talk about that so that family members, friends, you'll be able to protect the ones you love who may be struggling in silence. So please join us on September 26, uh, 2023 at 7 p.m. live right here on this Facebook page. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Take care, y'all.